that's new to Georgia Tech, a relatively new to Georgia Tech, uh, Juan Pablo Correa Maina. Um, Juan Pablo got his all of his degrees at the University of Connecticut, his bachelor's degree in management and the engineering, and then master's and PhD in environmental engineering before doing uh, two postdocs, uh, one at the Ecole Polytechnique in France and the other at MIT. Uh, I'm sorry. Switzerland. Switzerland. Uh, before coming uh, to uh, Georgia Tech last, just last year, uh, where he's an assistant professor in material science and engineering, uh, and for one who was relatively early on in his career, uh, he was cited or, um, or noted last year by Web of Science as one of their highly cited researchers. Uh, so it's a real pleasure. I think a lot of people are here from the audience, but kind of Thank you very much. Um, even though my degrees are strictly not related to what I'm going to be talking about. does, we focus on um, both understanding um, some specific properties of materials, um, role of interfaces, 2D and 3D defects in perovskite thin films. Uh, we studied these by advanced x-ray um, characterization techniques, especially at synchrotron. Um, and then also we, we design. And that's something that we do uh, more here at Georgia Tech. by uh, using vapor deposition of perovskites. Um, and I guess I'm not going to use this because it's not working very well. I'm just going to use the mouse. OK. Um, so, so I'm going to be telling you a little bit about the things that we do in the lab, the capabilities that we have, and hopefully how we can collaborate um, uh, with Georgia Tech and, and uh, our nanotech community here. So the uh, talk outlined here is going to be a little bit of an introduction to perovskites, an overview of what uh, perovskites are, why, why we're interested in them. I'm going to be talking about understanding and designing interfaces, defects, um, and stability, some of the published work that, that we have on that. And then finally, I'm going to be focusing uh, in our third part of the, of the talk uh, on ongoing projects and what kind of facilities we have that you can uh, benefit from uh, in terms of collaborating with us. All right, so the big energy challenge, I think that I don't need to convince you that we have um, a, a big task to fulfill, and is that our current world consumption is about 18 terawatt, um, uh, and then that's, that's 
predicted to be rising to 30 terawatts uh, by 2050. And so the uh, current uh, production of that energy is fossil fuels, uh, which I like to say impact the environment uh, in a negative way, um, and we'll have uh, eventually will we'll, we'll run out. But let's focus on trying to find alternatives to, to fossil fuels, and what do we have? So our target is 30 terawatts. Um, pre predicted from some uh, modeling, uh, we have potential to have wind of from two to four terawatts, um, and hydroelectric from four to five terawatts, um, geothermal uh, 10 terawatts, and solar energy if we were to fill the planet with, with solar panels, which we're not gonna do, um, is gonna be 36,000 terawatts. So we're talking about a, a huge scale uh, of energy production um, that, we're, that is mainly being untapped right now, and that there's a, a huge potential to, to, um, to, to be harvested. So my talk is gonna be focusing on solar energy, and I'm gonna go uh, from this very macro scale to the nano scale. Um, but first, let me give you a little bit of um, an economics to leverage on my business degree, <laughs> um, where we show here uh, how the price of a solar panel has um, made an impact in the deployment of solar panels worldwide. So here you can see that in 1975, um, a solar panel, let's say solar panel um, uh, cost per watt was about $100 um, uh, per watt. And that now, or at least in 2015, when we last tracked this, um, was at uh, 0.6, um, uh, so 60 cents per, per watt. Actually, that number is even lower right now. I, I need to update this, 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 this chart. But what has happened is that as, as long as we, we start uh, decreasing the price of, of a solar panel, uh, the deployment starts increasing. So that's the blue curve here. So we, got, we went from having practically no deployment of solar panels or for very specialized um, uh, applications to actually making an impact in the uh, production of, of energy worldwide, um, where in 2015 uh, that was at 65 gigawatts. And that's actually has taken off. That, ha that trend has continued. Um, as we, as, as, as the, the price of, of a solar panel became um, uh, uh, as competitive as, as coal and, and gas. Um, so so that's, um, that's from the perspective of, of the, the historic perspective and uh, one thing that we want to do is to actually continue lowering the, the cost of the solar panels uh, and there are two things that we can do to lower, to continue lowering the, the, the cost of, of of the solar panels towards uh, 60 cents per kilowatt hour, um, which uh, would be increasing module efficiency, as we can see here. So we can we can do two things, like uh, in this, this case, increasing module, module efficiency or increasing the lifetime of us, of, of that module. Um, so perovskite solar cells, and this is a, this is a model for perovskite solar cells specifically. Um, the community has been focusing mostly on solar cell efficiency for the past eight years since, since we started investigating these materials. How do we continue raising uh, the efficiency of these materials? Uh, and really not a lot of work has been done on the long-term stability, which as we can see here in the y-axis, um, that's a very, very important component as well because we can have a very high efficiency solar cell, but if it's uh, lasting for less than five years, we're not really gonna be competitive uh, with the prices of, of coal and, and, and gas. Um, so, I'm just highlighting here the first part of my talk, which I'm going to be talking about module efficiency, what we have done to understand the photophysics of these uh, devices in order to increase the efficiency of the solar cells. Um, the, the latter part of my talk um, and the work, some of the work that we're doing here at Georgia Tech uh, is going to be focusing on, on what, is, what is our understanding on uh, the lifetime of these devices. So why perovskite solar cells have risen to the spotlight is because we have these technologies um, that have been the traditional technologies that, that, that have defined the field of photovoltaics um, that include uh, gallium arsenide, crystalline silicon, uh, cadmium telluride, and SIGs. And it took them decades to arrive to this 
uh, efficiencies beyond 20% or, or let's say 22 or 23%. Um, what has happened with Perovska is, is that in a very short amount of time, uh, we've arrived at efficiencies that are as competitive with uh, the industrial equivalents. Um, cadmium telluride, uh, as you can see here, is right now at 23%, between 23 and 24%. Uh, for, a, for a small area solar cell, uh, and Perovska is right now at 25%. Cadmium telluride solar cells are currently commercialized by First Solar, um, so you can imagine that, that this is a very interesting material for people who are working in thin film um, uh, photovoltaics. So um, the past five years or six years that I've been working in perovskites, uh, one of my passions have been to try to understand why these materials are so good um, and how we can make them better. So let me just give you a brief introduction to perovskite solar cells. Here is a special edition um, of Science 2017, uh, showcasing my hand actually there with one of the solar cells that I made at, at MIT, where we wrote a review and they 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 dedicated a uh, whole section of, of, the, of the magazine to talk about perovskites and their potential not only in solar cells but also in LEDs um, and, and um, uh, photoelectrochemistry. And not only halide, lead halide perovskite but also um, some of the oxide perovskites uh, that are interesting. And so and here in this review I actually go over um, some of the things that I'm going to be talking about. So if, you, if you're interested in learning more about it you can, you can find it in science. Um, but here is a very basic concept of uh, a schematic of the solar cell and how it works. So here, normally we have a substrate that is glass uh, coated with FTO, which is a conducting um, oxide. And that's the, the gray area there that you see, this one here. And then we coat um, uh, electron selective contact, which can be TiO2, titanium dioxide, or tin oxide. Um, or some other materials, then we, uh, we coat that with a perovskite layer which is deposited at, at low temperatures and solu uh, in, in solution mo most of the time. I'll be talking about a little bit more some of the work that we're doing to try to avoid the solution and why that, why that is appealing for industry. Um, and also hole selective contact that is sitting on top of here. So basically we're selective holes. We have a selective hole contact here and a selective uh, electron selective contact here. Uh, and then we top off that by an, uh, either a transparent, um, uh, um, transparent conducting oxide like ITO, or we just, if we if we want to illuminate from the bottom, uh, from the glass side here, uh, we do we, we deposit gold or anything that is opaque. So um, if we look at an SEM image, uh, that's how that structure looks like. We have the perovskite. Um, uh, the perovskite layer that is sandwiched between this, this very, very thin electron selective contact, which is deposited by, by um, ALD. That's a tin oxide layer, that blue, blue, blue line there. It's a tin oxide layer, 15 nanometers. Then that um, hole selective contact there, it's a spirometad, it's about 200 nanometers. And our perovskite, which is about 500 nanometers. So photons get absorbed by the perovskite mostly. Um, and uh, electron holes are separated and collected at the uh, respective uh, interfaces, and we can produce electricity. So, um, so that was that was a solar cell. Now let's go into the perovskite, which is most of what I'm going to be talking about today. Um, ABX3 perovskites uh, are one of the most abundant minerals on Earth. Uh, it was first discovered as cal uh, calcium titanate. And it's a very versatile structure because um, it can take on many elements in this ABX3 um, structure. So we can have uh, substitutions of these elements uh, in many, many, many ways. So uh, for a computational chemist who is screening thousands and sometimes millions uh, of, of structures, this is a, this is a dream. Um, Rampi Ramprasad, I don't know if he's here, uh, has been working on and has some nice uh, papers on, on screening some of these um, uh, structures. So ABX3 halide perovskites, which is what I'm focusing on, um, uh, instead of having an oxygen, so calcium titanate, that oxygen part, it's substituted by 
uh, by a halide. And in general, for these halide perovskites that are interesting for photovoltaic applications and for LED applications, uh, we have our A site, uh, which is basically a templating um, uh, cation that is sitting in between this octahedra um, of lead iodide. Um, and that A site can be methyl ammonium, um, so it can be organic or from adenium, or it can be inorganic, so cesium and rubidium um, are typically used as well. Then we can have um, our B side, which is at the center of that octahedron, um, which can be made out of uh, lead, um, tin, or germanium. And the X side, which uh, has a halide, which can be an iodine, a bromine, or a chlorine. These are the most studied um, compositions or, or, or elements that, that, that have been placed in different compositions uh, for halide perovskite solar cells. Um, what is interesting about this is that once you modify the, for example, a, um, X site uh, of, of this ABX3, you can change the optical properties dramatically. In this case, we have uh, MAPBCL3, so methyl ammonium lead trichloride, that is transparent, so it absorbs very and it absorbs and emits very well in the in the UV or towards the UV. Uh, and as soon as we start mixing that. With bromine, uh, we start emitting or absorbing uh, more in the middle of, of, of the uh, visible spectrum, uh, around 600, five, between 500 and 600 um, nanometers. And then as soon as we go into the um, iodines, uh, we, we actually start absorbing and emitting more in the near infrared. So this is really interesting because um, people have been kind of a little bit shooting in the dark and try many, many different com combinations to try to make the most efficient solar cell. So if you, if you put, um, I, what I did here is try to classify what people were doing until 2014 and afterwards. Until 2014, most people were using um, MAPBA3 here. Uh, so that was basically the pure form and not mixed uh, of, of this iodine version. And then after 2014, there was a big paper that, that was published in, in Nature. That's when I joined also the field. Um, and uh, that, was, that was done by a group in Korea that showed that mixing uh, these this, uh, halides gives a very interesting result. And it was mainly not really understood until then what, what it was doing, but it was giving these very big boosts in efficiencies. As you can see here, we went from 15% uh, to above 20%. And that's in 2018 that, uh, fast forward to 2020 now, we have uh, efficiencies even beyond that. We have 25.3%. Um, so there's missing a, a little point there, a couple of points there. Um, the main reason why we think, we think now um, these perovskites are, are behaving so well despite being solution processed uh, is uh, due to point defect tolerance or, or, or defect electronic defect tolerance. Um, and so just a very brief introduction to the to point defect in perovskites or in, in semiconductors in general. Uh, we have our perfect lattice here. I need to, I need to use this. We have a, our perfect lattice here. Uh, we have vacancies, interstitials, um, anti-site substitutions. We have Frankel defects, uh, Schottky defects or we have impurity or substitutional, uh, substitutional impurities or interstitial impurities, where we have uh, one um, foreign element uh, substituting an, a, 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 host, a, a, um, a host element here, or an impurity where, where it's sitting somewhere um, outside of the lattice. And all of these in, in typical semiconductors uh, give rise to uh, what we call, or, or in the most case, in, in for the most part, give rise to deep traps, uh, electronic trap states in, in, in the semiconductor, which are undesirable because uh, they can serve as recombination pathways. So basically what happens is that when we introduce these, um, uh, these defects, these, these point defects, then an electronic defect gets created in the, in the, in the band gap, um, and then that, that leads to the, the creation of this, this deep trap state, and when an electron uh, is uh, photo excited to the conduction band, 
instead of being extracted via the conduction band um, to the outside circuit um, of, of the solar cell, we're actually uh, recombining or losing that electron within the band gap of the material. Um, so what happens is that it goes to a lower state, this, this deep trapped state that, that you see here, and uh, because that energy difference is so high, is not able to, to go back to the conduction band and it actually go, ends up going back to the valence band. So we lose that electron. And that's a very bad process uh, for a solar cell and for, for LEDs and for many applications. Um, what happens in perovskites is that for the most part, these point defects that we're creating that, 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 are, that are happening naturally or because of processing um, uh, are not really creating a deep uh, trap state. Instead, they're, crea they're creating what we call a shallow trap state. And that, that shallow trap state is so shallow, it's so close to the conduction band that electrons are able to be thermalized back into the conduction band um, and we don't lose that electron to, to recombination. We lose some of them, but we don't lose uh, a great deal of them. So this is what people have been referring to as uh, defect tolerance in perovskites and why um, these types of materials have been so successful uh, by making them in the lab by solution processing in a very, very dirty environment, we can get very high uh, performance. Uh, both in terms of the solar cell, but also in terms of um, uh, the carrier dynamics. So um, here you can see an example of a cadmium telluride made by a very, very clean, very, very specialized process um, uh, that requires high temperature and, and a bunch of different steps to, to, to purify uh, the precursor chemicals uh, and a perovskite that was made uh, in a relatively dirty um, process uh, in a glob box by solution processing. So you can see here that the photoluminescence decay of a perovskite is very similar to that of a cadmium telluride um, in, terms of, in terms of its decay uh, characteristics. Um, the longer this lives, the better it is for a solar cell because we want these carriers to, to, to be uh, alive in, in our material before they recombine um, within, within that um, within the band gap. All right, so we know a lot about point defects. Um, at least people, not me personally, people have been studying that uh, from a theory point of view and, and, and some people with very specialized uh, techniques and those are the, their conclusions. So I wanted to just give you a brief overview of that. Um, but um, what I was interested in uh, was more on the 2D and 3D defects, mainly because there are, there are a lot of things that we don't understand um, so 2D, 3D defects are things like crystal surfaces, the crystal termination um, of, of, of our perovskite. Um, also, grain boundaries, how grain boundaries are affecting things like charge carrier dynamics or ionic motion or uh, in the end solar performance. And finally, precipitate, so agglomeration of a specific element. Remember, we're, we're, we're processing these materials um, in solution, so we're relying on the, um, on the dissolution of some of these precursors and we're, we're working at really, really high concentrations of these precursors because we want very thick films, uh, or relatively thick, like 600 to 700 nanometers, uh, and for that we have to actually um, increase our concentration, so we are prone to create precipitates uh, within our films. So, uh, what I'm going to be discussing mostly um, throughout this presentation is going to be on, on grain sur uh, crystal surfaces and, and precipitates. I, I left out uh, grain boundaries just for the purpose of, um, of time. So let's start with crystal surfaces uh, and some of the things that we were interested in, in studying. Um, this was back in 2015, 2000, 2016. One of my colleagues at EPFL was studying the effects of stoichiometry, um, so basically varying the stoichiometries in, in your solution and then depositing films with these solutions um, on, on, on a substrate and making a solar cell. And very briefly, what this paper tells is that we have a record. Um, and uh, yeah, it sounds a little bit weird, but <laughs> sometimes in perovskites, this is what happens. People have a record and they just publish a record and that's, that's all. <laughs> Um, but I was more interested in trying to understand actually what was happening here. So I was, I was part of this study, but I wanted to dig more in depth 
um, into what actually is happening in, in, this, in these materials. And I knew that making, changing the stoichiometry had an effect in the solar cell, uh, for example, in terms of voltage, in terms of uh, the currents that we're extracting. So what are the things that we are interested in here? So I did a study uh, with one of my colleagues at EPFL, I uh, call Polytechnic Federal de Lausanne <laughs> in Switzerland, uh, where we varied systematically the ratio of formamidinium iodide and the lead iodide um, in uh, making materials that were stoichiometric, like the blue here, um, and, and organic excess and lead iodide excess. The organic excess is, is, is there in orange, and the lead iodide excess is here in gray. Um, and we made devices uh, from this because we wanted to just try to understand what is happening when, we, when we're making these devices. This is the first thing that one does at the, in the Gretzel lab. Um, it's kind of backwards. You don't start with a hypothesis there. You start, you start, with, a, you start with a device and then you, you try to uh, reverse engineer what's, what's happening in, in your device. Um, but you know, some labs work like that. So uh, what we f the first thing that we found that to me was interesting and everybody else ignored uh, was that the VOC has a, an upward trend when we go to the organic excess. And so the organic excess materials gave us higher voltages. Why were people ignoring this? Um, the, the basic, um, the basic uh, answer is that it gives also lower J JSCs. And the, pow the power conversion efficiency of these materials, of, this, of these devices, is a function of both the VOC and the JSC. But the, the, the JSC, the current of the device, is so low that your final efficiency is very low. So people were ignoring this result. They're like, OK, yeah, we, we get a little bit of an, a boost in VOC, but our JSCs are very low. Why would I care about that? Well, I cared about that because I thought that that was interesting. That, that actually decreases your recombination losses at, at somewhere in the device, so what is happening there? Um, so, so what we did, um, so yeah, here's the, the high efficiency window, what I called, and people are always interested in that, in that high efficiency window. Um, and me, yes, okay, efficiencies are nice, but also what is happening here, maybe we can learn something from this. Um, so just skip forward here, we, we wanted to try to understand what is happening in, in these perovskite films when we vary this, um, this stoichiometry. So we went to um, uh, the Bessie number no. two in Helmholtz Centrum Berlin, Berlin, where we collaborated with uh, uh, some beamline scientists there. And what we did was um, we varied the energy um, of the beam to try to probe at different uh, distances from the surface of, of the material um, to try to understand whether we could, to, whether we could uh, pinpoints what, where the organics are, uh, especially, because we have an excess of organics and that's giving us this, uh, this is a very interesting result. So what is happening with the organics? Are they at the surface? Are they in the bulk? Um, so here, uh, what we do is, is vary the energy and with that we can, that we can vary the depth profiling uh, that we can do. Um, so we have uh, these hard x-rays that, that are very good for, for this kind of application. Um, so in, in a film like the one you see here, we have an FTO glass or, or a piece of glass and then a perovskite layer that is about 600 nanometers. Uh, and then we're actually only able to see the very, very surface anyway of, of the film, but at least we can get some kind of comparison between the very, very surface or, or the first five nanometers um, and uh, the, the middle um, uh, part of, of, of that film. And the, and the bulk, which is all the way down to 18 nanometers. So we go from 5 nanometers to 11 nanometers, 18 nanometers. This is estimated, so don't, take, don't mark my word on, on those exact numbers. Uh, these are estimated from, from calculations on penetration of the beam. So what do we want to see? We want to see whether our surface, bulk, and middle have the same composition um, as, as uh, as, as, as we vary the, the ratios of iodine, of lead iodide to the organic part. So what we expect, based on, our, uh, on, on the precursors that we're putting in there, is that um, the iodine to lead ratio 
should be that line, uh, 2.55, based on, on a very complicated uh, mixture of chemicals that we have in there. Anything that, that we have that is excess, uh, that, that, that has higher ratio uh, than that will be organic. Anything that is below uh, lead iodide, uh, sorry, that, that line will be lead iodide rich. So what we see first is that the very surface, the first five nanometers, has this very FAI rich surface. So that this five, first five nanometers has, have a lot of, um, of the organic sitting on the top. Uh, and that really is regardless of, um, of the composition. So here we have our lead iodide excess, still has a lot of, um, of the organic, but significantly less than, um, than the stoichiometric and the, F and, the, and the organic excess. So the organic excess definitely has more at the surface. Um, then when we go into the middle, then uh, we, we still have uh, that same trend, which is that the formamadinium iodide excess is, has the highest amount of organic. Uh, then the stoichiometric is here, and then the lead iodide excess is closer to the, to the expected. Um, but all of them really have that excess of, of organic sitting, sitting at the surface. Um, and then finally, once we go into these higher energies and we can di uh, uh, probe deeper, uh, we go closer to the lead iodide uh, expected values, or to, to the iodine to lead uh, expected values, especially for the um, lead iodide excess, sorry, for the for organic excess. Uh, and definitely we have some excess of lead iodide for uh, the lead iodide excess uh, materials. Okay, there's a lot of words that I just said there. <laughs> so I want to I wanna just draw a schematic so that maybe we can, we can uh, have a break. So the, lead, the, the organic excess material, whatever we put uh, excess organic in our precursor, has a, a thicker layer in general of this organic sitting on the top of the, of, of the perovskite crystal. Uh, compared to the stoichiometric and the lead iodide excess. We, we, have, uh, we also have um, excess of this organic at the surface for these two compounds, but we have uh, systematically, we see more excess of the FAI at the surface um, for, 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 for materials that we're putting excess in solution. Um, so, so this was interesting and, and, and just made us think a lot about what is happening here? So how can we relate this to this gain in VOC? Um, we, we know that we have higher VOCs for these materials that have a thicker layer of this organic sitting on top. Uh, and I want to mention this was done in 2015, and I will, I will, I will tell you in, in a minute why this is important. Um, and we thought, OK, maybe the hypothesis is that we have this FAI rich um, component that is, that is really sitting at the whole selective contact and the perovskite, and that is preventing recombination um, from happening. So basically surface recombination is avoided once we have this thicker layer um, of, of, um, uh, of formamadinium simply because we have a wider band gap. So we, we're, we're making use maybe of tunneling or something. Something is happening there that is, that is preventing the, the recombination and is related to that um, to that thicker layer of, of formamadinium. The reason why now this, we were very scared to put this hypothesis forward because, because we were not sure. This was the first time somebody who was suggesting that. And the reason why it's very important now is because all the new um, compositions that you see in the literature with efficiencies beyond 23% are using exactly that. They're, they're on purpose depositing. Um, an FAI or a, or a, a, a bulky cation uh, in between the perovskite and the whole selective contact. So the 25% efficiency uh, from MIT that I was part of um, uh, that happened last year, um, and that's certified but not published, that uses a layer that is um, from a madinium rich and uh, PEI rich uh, in between those, those two layers. So we were very scared of, of putting this, this forward, and, and we have some indications that, the, that, that this kind of accumulation of organic at the, at, the, at, the, at the interface is important, but we were really not sure at that time. Now we're, we're pretty convinced that that's, that's an important part of, um, of that combination. 
to make a very efficient solar cell. All right, so moving forward to precipitates, which is um, my, my most recent work, at least as a postdoc, um, which uh, was published actually almost a year ago in Science, where we tried to understand the halide compositions um, both in terms of agglomeration, so we use uh, a technique called XRF, X-ray fluorescence um, uh, mapping, uh, and also in terms of the electronics, so a technique called XBIC that I will uh, introduce in a little bit. And um, one thing that people have been um, wondering about is what's happening when you're mixing all of these halides together. We have indications from PL that as soon as we shine um, a laser into, into our samples, uh, the, the PL peaks, the PL, the single PL peak splits into two or three sometimes. So maybe there's halide segregation happening when we're mixing these these materials. Uh, so this technique was was very efficient to try to understand that. So I, I joined the group of Tonio Bonassisi at MIT, who had been studying um, silicon solar cells and defects in solar in in, in silicon solar cells with this specific technique, uh, nano XRF uh, mapping. Um, for his whole career. Now he's doing more material screening and machine learning, but um, I joined his group specifically to learn more about this technique and to try to translate this technique uh, into perovskites to see how we could use this specific technique for perovskite, uh, understanding defects and things in, in perovskites. So um, the basic gist of, of this technique is that we, we can actually put our whole device in there. We have a very uh, high penetration depth uh, so we can go through microns of the device. Remember, our device is about one micron, so we have more than enough signal coming off from the solar cell that we can probe even the glass. So we can probe everything in there. Uh, and just as a simple example, what we can do is we can, we can actually um, um, map the elements uh, in very, very small areas. So this is just a very simple example. Here, our, our scale bar is 50 microns, so we're looking at the edge of that gold pattern there. Um, and remember, we can put the whole device in there, so we can actually also probe the device as we're ex exciting this with, uh, with x-rays. Um, and the reason why, um, as, I, as I was mentioning before, why we're, we're interested in this technique is because people have been mixing a bunch of crazy things in here. Um, so people have been putting cesium, rubidium, organics, lead, tin, iodine, bromine, and sometimes chlorine, uh, chlorine also now. So uh, we don't know exactly what's happening when we put all these things together. So again, uh, there was another record uh, when I was at EPFL, so 21.6% with high reproducibility, blah, 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 very good, interesting. Uh, but people didn't really, like we didn't really understand what was happening. We needed to go more in depth. Um, this paper made it into science at the time with just a high efficiency and high stability and reproducibility, um, but I, I really just wanted to focus mostly on what was happening with the materials. Uh, so that's when when I used the techniques at, at the synchrotron. So one of the things that, that we found was that um, uh, mixing these halides, so mixing iodine and, and, and bromine, leads to uh, uh, heterogeneity. So here you can see areas that are bromine poor. You can see those contours here of this, this, these areas in the film that are poor in bromine and some areas that are rich or, or the expected ratio um, of iodine to bromine. And um, the, big, the big discovery that one of my colleagues made at, at, uh, at EPFL was that mixing um, this iodine and bromine compo compound with cesium and rubidium would lead to this improved efficiencies. Uh, so when we have only what we call mixed halides, so no cesium or rubidium, uh, this is what you see, is the bromine poor, poor, bromine poor regions, uh, lots of agglomeration, heterogeneity. So what happens there is that we actually start seeing split of the PL, for example. Uh, so we have uh, here our mixed bromide uh, signal where we, we see basically the, the PL not really showing a single band gap but two. Um, and then that leads also in, in, in general to recombination pathways because we have several band gaps, several uh, energy transfers before we actually able to extract uh, these electrons from, uh, from the material. Uh, 
So what happens when we add cesium? That heterogeneity disappears. Um, when we add rubidium, it's the same. And when we add both, uh, it's the same. So we actually have a very good strategy, which um, a little uh, side note, we still don't know why this is happening. We're still trying to understand what is happening. Uh, but we know is that what we know is that cesium and rubidium are inducing this, this homogen, homogenization of the halides um, in perovskites, which is very important um, for having a solar cell that doesn't have a lot of losses. All right, so we can actually quantify that. Um, we can create these binary maps of the bromine to uh, lead ratio, as you can see here. So that's let's say a, an expanded. Uh, version of that small map that I showed you before, where we have a lot of um, uh, heterogeneity. Uh, and then we can actually get these binary maps and then uh, use m very simple MATLAB code to try to identify these areas in little, little squares and then quantify um, the amount of homogenization. So ratio of uh, bromine poor areas to the total area. So you can see here very clearly that for our mixed halides, so basically no, um, uh, no alkali metals added, this one, um, we have a very high ratio of bromine poor areas, and that dramatically drops as we add cesium, rubidium, or both. Um, so that's good. That's a, that's a good result. We, we wanted to, to try to understand halide homogenization as we're adding this, uh, as we're adding this, this uh, uh, alkali metals, but then what happens with rubidium? Because that was the big question people were having at the time. Uh, when you add rubidium, what is happening with your, with your film? So here you can see uh, the rubidium emission lines. Um, it's a map also. So of course, the mixed halides have no rubidium, uh, so we don't see anything. Uh, but as soon as we start adding rubidium at 1%, we see this agglomeration of particles um, of rubidium that, that, that show up. Um, same thing happens when we have 5% uh, of rubidium. We see this kind of this dendrotype um, structures that, that form in the film. Uh, again, this is, th these are all 10 micrometer uh, scale bars. So we have quite large tentacles forming uh, in this, in this, uh, in this, in this thin film, uh, and then when we have the five percent rubidium and the five percent cesium, we have this high concentration of um, of, of particles that are that are agglomerating in, in in your film. Another thing that became a trend in the field is to add potassium. So I didn't mention that because I kind of try to ignore potassium um, mainly because. I think we should put less stuff in our in our pearls, guys, and not more. Uh, we should try to cr try to understand what it, what is it that these these elements are doing, rather than than adding more without understanding. Um, and so, but yeah, there was a big trend. Adding potassium if affects recombination dynamics. This is a, a group um, worked by Sam Strangs and Richard Friend. Um, they put that in there and and see an imp improvement in in the PL intensity and in the performance. Uh, and actually, we, we do see that, that as we add uh, this potassium um, in solution, we, ha we have the same kind of behavior. We have this agglomeration of particles, which should be undesirable. We shouldn't have um, this kind of heterogeneous uh, behavior in, in, or, or formation in our, in our, in our films. Um, the reason why, I'm going to explain why with XBIC, um, is because these agglomerations are recombination active. So we, we actually form recombination centers in these uh, in these particles that are dead for current and for 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 voltage. So we're actually losing current and voltage um, because of these uh, small agglomerations. So XBIC is a very cool technique because we can um, use the X-ray beam to photo excite to to excite um, our 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 device and actually measure in situ, or, or let's say uh, on site, that specific local performance. Uh, so here is another example of, of our XRF um, signal. So that's that, um, that corner there. So wherever we have gold, we should have collection of, of electrons. Uh, so you can see that the XBIC signal is giving us some signal there. Um, 
And we basically, what we do is just connect our, our solar cell to a Kithli, and as we're bombarding our material with, um, with, with uh, x-rays, we can measure uh, the currents that we're collecting from it. So here is uh, an example of that. Um, here we have the XRF on the top. Um, so we, we just zoom in, in in this specific area here, and you can see that, that little dendrite, struc dendrite type structure here. Um, and then we can actually correlate that with the XPIC, the current that we're collecting, uh, pixel by pixel. And you can see that that dendrite here um, correlates to a low current here. And so in the, in the center of that dendrite also correlates to, um, to dead areas. And so what we can do is actually um, make some uh, quantitative analysis. We did actually a much more sophisticated version of this uh, analysis in the paper, if you're interested in looking at it. But what we can, we can basically see is that wherever we don't have any um, rubidium counts, uh, we have a wider spread. That's mainly due to uh, the technique itself, but we have the highest current uh, possible. Wherever we have uh, high amounts of rubidium, um, those currents drop dramatically. So we have a lot of noise in our data, mainly because the technique is not very sophisticated yet. We're still working on it, but so we have we have a lot of noise, and that's that that bottom part of the um, of the XPIC signal is just noise. Uh, but what we can see is that we have very high currents uh, for areas with zero counts of rubidium. Whereas as we start uh, decreasing, increasing the amount of rubidium, that, that signal um, of, of current decreases. Okay, so just to finalize uh, this, this part, uh, findings uh, that we have are that cesium and rubidium homogenize the, uh, the halides of these perovskites, um, which is good. In general, um, it's a good thing. We know that the heterogeneity in halides are, is, is detrimental to the device performance. Uh, but also, adding rubidium, especially at very, these very high concentrations, leads to uh, recombination centers. So that's, that's on the negative side. So we basically have to do something to homogenize the halides without um, having rubidium and potassium in there, which are rec uh, recombination active. All right, now we, uh, I can show you a little bit of the things that we can do. I'm gonna go very briefly over this, but this is a, a picture of, uh, of our lab. We're gonna have a, um, a photo shoot tomorrow, so hopefully I'll have better, better pictures for you next time. Uh, but we have a glove box train, uh, two fume hoods, an ALD inside, and, and within this glove box train we can do solution processing. Uh, we can do evaporation of metals and organics. Uh, we can also do characteristics. We have a, one glove box that you're not seeing on the right that is for characterization only. So if you want to do um, oxygen sensitive, uh, you want to prepare oxygen sensitive samples and do characterization on them, you can do that here. Um, let me just uh, very briefly tell you uh, about all the things that we do. Uh, for example, we do um, uh, synchrotron techniques, some, the ones that I've shown you before. Uh, some things that we're exploring right now is GWAX. Uh, I'll show you a couple of slides on that. Um, Zanes and Zafs, uh, which we're, we're working with um, Faisal Alamgir, um, and, and XRF, XPIC, these kind of things we're doing um, on our own, and, and, and we're, we're very happy to collaborate with anybody who's interested in doing uh, some of these. We're also trying to get into the neutron um, aspect of things, and, uh, but we haven't been successful yet with proposals. Uh, but we have active proposals in uh, GWAX, Zanes, XRF, and XPIC, so um, those should be, should, should be good to go. In terms of design, um, as I was mentioning, we have um, an ALD. And this ALD is, the, the, the whole purpose of this ALD is to, to try to grow perovskites um, in, in the nanoscale or monolayer if possible. Um, so we have capabilities for molecular layer deposition. Um, and we also have a physical vapor deposition system uh, that, we, that we have, for which we have uh, 10 sources and we can do organics, organic materials, and uh, perovskites as well. So we're, we're actually developing our own perovskite uh, recipes uh, by, by PVD, mainly because I've heard a lot of concern from industry uh, about solution processing. Industry doesn't really want to work with, with solvents, uh, at least the industries that are doing um, PV. 
um, and that's exactly for solar. <laughs> Uh, they basically want to be able, if in the future perovskite becomes a, a doable technology uh, in terms of spasticity and all that stuff, they want to make sure that they're compatible with the systems that, that, that they already have, which is PVD mostly. Um, so we're, we're, we have a big, big effort on PVD and, and I hope next time I can show you more results on this. Uh, for now I don't have any, um, we have some preliminary data but I'm not showing it here. So here is, here is our, our train line that I was showing you before. Uh, we have uh, our PVD systems in this corner over here. All of them are connected with small and large uh, anti-chambers. So we can do basically all of our characterization, uh, solution deposition and PVD deposition uh, in one uh, inert environment. Um, I'm not going to really go into details here. Here are our evaporators from Kurt Lesker, uh, top of the line for the type of processes that we're doing. Um, our ALD system, which has two low vapor pressure delivery vessels, um, which help us deposit things like organic materials and things. Um, and also advanced characterization methods, um, which include uh, stability, so try to understand degradation mechanisms and things like that. And with that, I want to go very, very quickly for the last two minutes into degradation, because this is something that, that I wanted to cover at least um, uh, briefly because it's it's important. Um, so Juanita Hidalgo in my group has been working on trying to understand the effects of uh, humidity on perovskite uh, degradation and formation. Uh, so she designed this very interesting experiment which I'm not going to really go into detail but basically uh, she exposes them to humidity uh, then uh, exposes them to nitrogen and sees what the effects are in terms of um, uh, morphology, structure, uh, performance, stability, and, and the whole thing. So uh, here is the, the, the basic gist of that. Uh, samples are made in a nitrogen glow box. They're exposed to relative humidity for 48 hours, uh, relative humidity of 50 to 80 percent for 48 hours, then put back into the glow box in nitrogen, uh, and then you make a solar cell. So um, following my previous uh, bad examples. Uh, here we make uh, some solar cells and we see that um, for the most part uh, when we expose our samples to, to water uh, there's a decrease in the efficiency of the solar cell. Um, that's, that was expected. We know that perovskites are, are, are um, uh, susceptible to water so we're, we were expecting that but then actually when we change the stoichiometry for example we have the FAI excess actually the effect is, is the opposite. Uh, I'm not going to go into the details of that, uh, mainly because I'm running out of time. Uh, but one of the things that we found is that the, the morphology of these films are changing. For example, for the FAI excess, for the organic excess, uh, here we have um, growth, uh, grain, uh, grain growth, for example. Uh, so definitely some reorganization of, um, of the material here. And then we were able to do some GWAX at the synchrotron where we see uh, things like uh, appearance of, of different peaks, so in, impurities, uh, which for the purpose of, of this specific sample we see a decrease uh, in the performance. Um, we can see that, that these impurities that are showing up that are not, not super bright and clear there um, are affecting the, the, uh, the, the performance of the solar cell. Uh, for the for mamadinium iodide excess for the organic, we actually see a degradation of, of of the, of the material, so we actually see broadening of, of some of these peaks. And if we actually integrate some of that, we actually see changes um, in the um, lattice structure. So we see either contraction or expansion um, of the lattice of the perovskite. Um, just very briefly, sorry, um, I know I, I ran out of time, but I just want to show you this last couple of slides um, where we do some XBIC. So for the lead iodide excess materials, we, we expose them to humid, um, humid air, humid conditions. And we see very little changes in the bromine distribution from the, from the pristine samples, but then we start seeing some degradation in the XPIC. So the currents actually start uh, decreasing and start decreasing in areas where the bromine starts agglomerating. So you can see here bromine agglomeration here and then uh, degradation of that area uh, in terms of the solar cell performance. You can see here that, that that's pretty homoge homogeneous uh, and that's pretty homogeneous before these films are exposed to, humid, to, to humidity. 
Um, and for the uh, organic excess, this is even more severe. So for the pristine samples, uh, we have a pretty homogeneous sample, uh, with the exception maybe of, of these areas here. But then as soon as we um, start, as, as soon as we expose them to humid air, uh, we, we start forming these very large clusters of bromine. So we're still trying to understand these. These are some preliminary data that I wanted to show you that was relevant to what I was talking about. Um, but we're still trying to understand the chemistry behind this um, and, and what is happening there. Take home message, I'm not going to go into that. So I just want to thank the group, um, PhD students. We have uh, four PhD students in the group. Uh, for, for visiting students uh, from, from all around the world, from Canada, Colombia, Turkey, and China, um, postdocs and undergrads who have made uh, the labs work uh, in a very short amount of time. So thank you very much. So the, the short answer is we don't know. I don't know. Um, <laughs> so I'm not implying anything. <laughs> the, the short answer is we're still trying to understand that. And, and, and how we're, we're actually designing experiments right now to try to understand that. Um, how? We make the perovskite in, in a, let's say, lead iodide rich uh, environment in solution processing. And then we evaporate the organic um, in, in that surface. Uh, by by PVD, and then we de we we deposit very uh, various thicknesses of that layer uh, to try to see if we can mimic some of these conditions. Um, in terms of actually understanding what is happening with those specific samples, what we're doing is we're actually trying to understand uh, for, with GWAX, trying to use different angles to see if we can actually probe different depths of that of that film. Um, to see, yeah, to, to actually understand what is what is happening at that, uh, in terms of composition, not only composition but also in terms of structure. Um, so yeah, that's th that's excellent. That's an excellent question. We at the time when we when we started working with this, we just kind of say, okay, this is what we found, but we there was, there, there's still a lot of unknowns, and, and that's why we're using these very fancy techniques to try to understand that. Mm -hmm. thanks. Yeah, thanks. That's a very good question. Yeah, actually, no. The the so y you're talking about the exciton binding energy. They're very low in perovskites, actually, uh, in 3D lead halide perovskites. <laughs> Once you start getting into the 2D lead halide perovskites, then your exciton binding energies are very high, and you have Coulomb Coulombic attractions that are very strong. So you, these excitons are very very bound and very difficult to split and to and to be extracted. Um, so for lead, for lead uh, based 3D perovskites, um, the exciton binding energies are in, in the range of 5 to 10. Uh, whereas for 2D, we're talking about like hundreds. Do you have any for the definition of 2D? Yeah, so 2D perovskites will have normally a very long chain in the A site. So then you don't actually have corner sharing in the in one of the planes. So you have separated um, uh, you, you have separated corner sharing 
octahedra that are maybe 2D in, so in, in, in this plane, but not, not in, the, in the Z, for example. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And we'll see you in two